In the morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ, how are you today? Thank you so very much for listening to St. Mark and Bemidji's podcast, the only podcast in Bemidji, Minnesota, dedicated to spreading God's word to the people that need it most. You. Somebody's got to do it. Many of you are probably familiar with Mike Rowe. You know, the dirty jobs guy. The champion for the working man. He brings out the unsung hero to the front of the crowd, makes us appreciate the jobs that no one else wants to do, and gives them the appreciation and recognition that they deserve. I would imagine some of you are out there thinking to yourself, boy, if only we had some people to recognize in church for all the hard work they do. If it weren't for me and a couple of my friends, we might as well turn out the lights for good in the sanctuary. Some others of you might be saying, if only the young people would step up and volunteer in the church, then we'd really be getting somewhere. I'm not talking about church building projects here. I'm talking about the Great Commission. You know, the one recorded in Matthew chapter 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Some of you might recall a verse from much earlier in the same gospel account. Matthew 9, verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. It sure seems like it, doesn't it? But don't be too sure that the workforce is as thin as it might seem at first glance. We can pretty easily see the preacher at the front of the church. At some churches, he's even decorated pretty in robes and fancy work so we know who he is. And the elders? Well, they look older for one but they're usually the guys who dress up just a little nicer than the rest of the congregation. And who can miss the electrician or the mason worker trying to look comfortable in that button-up shirt on a Sunday? Well, you know he was working on a project in the fellowship all Saturday because you saw his truck in the parking lot when you drove by, didn't you? And you can't hide a working man's hands, can you? These, these are the workers, right? Well, sure, and good on them. We need them. But it's more than just that. We go through seasons in our life, which our professional life echoes. Most of us started in a menial job, and then as we gained experience, or maybe as we completed an apprenticeship or a degree, we moved up in the workforce, financially, in responsibility, and in technical know-how. Some of us even wound up running our own company. It's the same with our life in Christ. First, we're children, and then we grow in knowledge and faith, and we get confirmed. As we mature into adulthood, we often marry and have our own children. And if we're following the command of the Lord in creating our families, as found in Proverbs 22, start children off in the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it? Well, then we are the workers, just as surely and just as important as that pastor up front. After all, unless your name is Billy Graham you probably will only have the opportunity to truly share the word of Christ to a handful of people. Our children are our greatest evangelism opportunity that we will ever have. And then the leaves start to turn golden and brilliant in our next season, and our children are off to have their own families, and we're getting to that age where we've saved up enough to where we don't have to work every day just to make ends meet what most Americans call retirement. This is another season. The Apostle Paul, in the epistle to Titus, urges him to teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. And likewise, he commands older men to be temperate, worthy of self-respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. The work isn't done for a Christian when they get older. It just changes. Sure, they might not be doing the grunt work anymore, but they have a role of great importance, guiding the next generation 
while still working alongside them. True rest only comes when all of us join in worship and song around the throne of God. So, what about that verse about the workers being few? Well, the next verse answers it. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And here we are, by his command, the workers in the field, shoulder to shoulder, every position manned, so that God's will that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved is carried out. Our meditation for today comes from Timothy Church in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. It's titled, Suffering as Crossbearing, and is based on a reading from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. I didn't say a word, did I? But what did I just do? How much we communicate to each other. It can be just this, as opposed to that. Or it can be, oh, and I just preached a whole sermon, maybe. Not a good one, but preach one. Right? And what is this groaning thing? And what do we do with this suffering that causes the groaning? What do we do with the problem of suffering? Because again, God has given us this beautiful gift of faith. He's also given us this gift of logic, which he is restoring in us. And we make a logical deduction. God is all-powerful, and God has a profound love beyond any love we've ever experienced. And therefore... He can stop suffering. He can stop it. And yet, what do we observe in the Word of God? That suffering continues. You cannot deny this. And so we come away with this truth. It is accurate to say that God has given us only one promise. The forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ's death. And everything else, he gives us other blessings, he loves to give us blessings, but anything else is an extra and was not promised. So as we think about that, then God goes on to say that suffering is going to be there and continue. The book of Revelation, my goodness, if there's anything that confuses you about that book, set that aside. One thing that's clear is that suffering, God allows it to happen to his church. And not only that, God says there's going to be this suffering that causes us to groan, suffering that is unique to Christians. Just knowing the truth and being surrounded with lies and having lies in our own heads, that is already suffering. So what do we do with it? Well, today we are going to look at suffering as it is. Suffering is cross-bearing. And therefore, yes, we are going to feel the weight of our own personal cross that God gives to us. But because suffering is cross-bearing, there is hope. I just did the groaning thing before. Or sighing thing. And groaning is a strange thing because it is something you cannot really ignore. If somebody's doing it in your household, you can't really ignore it. It's just there. And yet God through Paul says this other kind of groaning that's happening, this one not so readily understood. All of creation is groaning. What is that? Well, this is where pastor has to put on his guessing hat. Because the apostle doesn't lay it out. But we can make an educated guess. I would make the guess that it is Hurricane Idalia. Not just that, obviously. But as an example, in Hurricane Adalia, I'm very pleased to announce our synod locations down there in Florida have reported in. No damage. It's not as bad. But there have been hurricanes in the past and in the future that, my goodness, the amount of damage and death toll that they inflict. Groaning. And if this is accurate, what I just put forth as my guess, the groaning of creation, you cannot ignore it. If you ignore it, it will come to you all the same. So as we think on these things, this groaning, what if 
God gave us a paradise plan. Where we ourselves were now imperfect, where we were sinners, and yet the world around us was flawless. The entire planet was like Hawaii or something. What would we do with that? I'm going to answer that question in just a little bit as we think on that. But Paul goes on to say that in spite of all of these things like hurricanes and the many other disasters that are happening in this world as the tectonic plates shift underneath our feet and cause massive earthquakes, as all these things happen, the Apostle Paul has the gall to say, yeah, this present suffering that you're going through, it's not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. We would be remiss if we don't remember who again is saying these words is it really paul finally it is god himself who says your present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed and yet he spoke through the apostle paul and with him and paul was uniquely qualified to say this and make this statement not because he was some ubermensch or superman no but because of what god had given him do you remember when Paul first became a Christian? The name changed from Saul to Paul. And we don't know exactly why that changed, but it did. Do you remember when God came to Ananias and said, Ananias, hey, believer, love you. You're going to go to Paul and baptize him into the church. And Ananias said, you know, this is the guy who's been following us around and arresting us and killing us. You get that, right, Lord? Just in case you missed it. And then God dropped this truth. I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. And oh, how Paul suffered. Of all the people in Scripture, I'm not going to say he suffered more than anybody, but we have such a comprehensive list, and I'll just name one, where he was dragged outside of the city walls and stoned. I've never had that happen. I imagine it must be horrible to not even be able to protect where the next stone is going to hit, what bone it's going to break next, what organ it's going to destroy next. And yet Paul says that not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. And Paul was qualified to say this as well, because in the book that was written probably just two years before this one, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, Paul says this, and he is speaking about himself. He says, And I know a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but God knows. I know a man who was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things. Things that no one is permitted to tell. Paul saw paradise. And the way he speaks of it, it seems like he saw paradise as it's going to be, and not a picture of it, but as it's going to be. And then he says, not worth comparing. Getting stoned outside of the city walls, people dragging you out and killing you, that's not worth comparing. Or to put it in a positive way, Paul, paradise is that good? That's our answer. So as we think on this comparison, we would be careful to say not all comparisons are good. If I made a sermon today and said, be like Paul, or you people said to me, the pastor, you be like Paul. No, horrible way to teach. You never tell a class, be like the kid who gets the A's, the straight A's and puts the apple on my desk, kids. That's not a good way of teaching. But our God seems to have chosen this. How many times in his life, in Jesus' ministry, did he not compare things that we don't know? The glories of heaven to things that we do know. A farmer scattering seed in a field. And so God with Paul tells us, this thing that you do not understand that is so good, even the things you hear there cannot be expressed even if you wanted to. This is yours. Now, we might say, good. That's a future thing. That's a future thing, Lord. How does that help me today? 
Well, you notice there is a hope spoken of in this lesson. A hope as the world groans that creation is going to be free. A hope that we ourselves express through groans as we await the perfection of our bodies. But did you notice there's another hope? It's right here. I'll read it in our lesson. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. Make this make sense is what I, in my arrogance and my sinful nature, would say to God. Make this make sense. What you just said, God, is you cursed the world to liberate it. Because the will being spoken of here, is that Adam? No. Is it Eve? No. This is God himself. I'm cursing the world in order to liberate it. I'm going to explain this with, of all things, tobacco. And no, I'm not trying to select this as the one sin. But tobacco. How many years, decades, into the 20th century did our culture think, smoking's good? You ever notice when you, when you light up, it actually releases you. You can actually breathe easier and more freely and you get a little boost of energy. Ever notice that? It took decades of scientific studies to finally bring us around to this idea that oh, maybe, maybe it's not so good. Maybe now that I see that lung cancer is attached to it, yeah, maybe this thing is not so healthy after all. Do we even need scientists and consensus among scientists to finally tell us that that was bad? What are they going to look at in the year 2023 and say, what were we thinking in our time, right? But the point is, you can have a danger right in front of your face and ignore it. Or not see it at all. Do you remember when the Israelites were complaining about this detestable manna food that God gave us? And we don't want this food, and he never gives us water. We want to go back to Egypt. And God sent venomous snakes. Remember that? That's an example of suffering and groaning and terror as a result. And then God told Moses, put up a bronze snake on a pole, and everybody who looks at it will live. And you can bet, I don't know how good of an artist Moses was, but that was probably the most rapidly slapped together kind of snake in you know, an art in existence, and he slapped that thing, put it on top of the pole, and people looked. And even as people were dying or already dead and lifeless around them, even as the snakes were still slithering around their feet, all of life became look right there at the snake, the bronze one, and you will live. Suffering has a way of focusing us on something beyond just this world. What if this was a paradise planet? We're already professionals at ignoring death, that one. How much more so if this world was all like Hawaii? It'd be like, no, we're good, we're fine. We're all fine here. <coughs> Suffering. And our Lord Jesus tells us what his hope truly is. He tells us it. 1 Peter chapter 1, In his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection, there it is, of Jesus Christ from the dead. And again in Hebrews chapter 6, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And one more verse, when Jesus said, John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Look there. It's not a bronze snake. That was just a picture. Look just there. It says Jesus to each of us, look at me and you will be saved. Dear friends, this is how this crazy verse makes sense. How God uses suffering to focus us and the curse actually causes us then to be liberated. And now we wait. And we actually wait in eager expectation. How is that possible? It's a miracle of God. We eagerly await the destruction of everything. 
which is another thing that the unbeliever might say, make that make sense. We eagerly await the return of our Lord Jesus and the new creation. Like the disciples looking up after Jesus ascended, but in reverse, the same way, Jesus coming back with his heavenly army. Those who have no faith in Christ have accused us Christians of being too future focused. And I'm going to take the accusation and say, yeah, you're kind of right about us Christians. So much of our blessings is backloaded. It comes later. But you know what? Unbelievers can teach us something. Look at the way that an unbeliever can eagerly throw themselves into their studies or into their work and get it done with excellence. And they believe that they go to nothing but dust when they die. And we might retort that as Christians, well, yeah, everything about their life is now. They have to focus on now. I would turn that around and say they have nothing but now, and yet they strive for excellence. Not everybody who's, not a, um, who's an unbeliever, but so many. And we have the hope that is to come. Can we not display this eagerness, not just for the future, but display eagerness now, excellence now? Because know this, whatever groaning you have from whatever suffering God has given you, last time I checked, Jesus is no longer carrying his cross. It comes to a definitive end. And that's why I said before that in the fact that suffering is cross-bearing, there is hope. Because that suffering will come to an end. We just had evidence of that. How long are we going to live? Some people live to be 99 years. Some people live to be 105. We know that it comes to an end. This is the hope that we have. So we tend to be a glass half empty human race. Where we look at trees outside and we think of that Simon and Garfunkel song. You look at the one across the parking lot. And the leaves that are green turn to brown, and they wither with the wind, right? And they crumble in your hand. Be half full. You can look at those leaves and say, guess what? It's getting ready for the next spring. Guess what? When I leave the hospital, it's a reminder, not just of sickness, but I do make a recovery, which makes me think of the recovery to come. Guess what? I just graduated from high school, and I'm going into college. I successfully made the transition. I'll make the transition through the river of death itself. Anything you can think of in a negative way, we can dive into with eagerness today and say, yes, it's also a reminder of what's to come. Dear friends, as you think on this problem of suffering, what do we do with it? You've got to address it as Christians. You can't just ignore it. God says all kinds of suffering will happen, and I want to be real careful here. You may be the Christian who has the most suffering ever in history, but have the greatest and strongest faith ever. And the opposite is true. You may have the weakest faith of any Christian, and you have more, or I should say, less or no suffering at all. My point is this. Don't ever gauge the strength of your faith on how much suffering you have, or your relationship to God and His love of you on how much suffering or lack of it you have. Don't do that. What we can say about suffering is it can focus us on the future. I would be the first to admit, I'm in it with you in the trenches, I have a sinful nature. Lord, I don't need any suffering to teach me that. Apparently he disagrees. So as we think of the wisdom of God, think of the present. And then think of the future, and now, with what God has in store for you, be truly present in the moment. Be even excited about it. Dare I say it, throw yourself into this life. Because when you see that kind of excitement, that kind of excitement can be contagious. And who knows? Who might just see it? Amen. We hope that today's meditation on God's Word has enriched you. Divine services are held right here in Bemidji, Minnesota at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Sunday school and adult Bible study is also offered between our Sunday services at 9.15 a.m. 
Our church services are live streamed at 8 a.m. on Sunday mornings and are available afterwards on our channel, St. Mark Lutheran Church Bemidji. If you're listening or watching this podcast, you are cordially invited to join us in person next week and every week. This is our fourth year producing this podcast, and there is a large archive of devotional material online available if you want to learn more about God and His Word. Visit www.stmarkbemidji.org or look in the show notes in this podcast for a link to this and many other meditations on God. You can also search for St. Mark Bemidji on YouTube to find our channel. If you have any questions or you would like more information about our church and its ministry, please visit our website, which is once again, www.stmarkbemidji.org. All scripture readings are taken from the Holy Bible, New International Version, copyright 2011, and are used by permission from Zondervan. Meditation's daily devotional is published by Northwestern Publishing House and is also used by permission. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider subscribing and telling a friend. May God bless the rest of your day. Hey there, parents. Are you on the lookout for a fantastic school in the Bemidji area that embraces Christian values? Well, look no further. Introducing St. Mark's Christian Day School, where education meets faith in an extraordinary way. At St. Mark's, we get it. We understand that your child's education should be rooted in God, compassion, and unwavering faith. Our experienced team of dedicated educators are here to provide a top-notch education to students in grades K through 8 that nourishes the mind, heart, and soul. With small class sizes and a personalized approach, we create a safe and dynamic environment where your child can explore the God-given talents and excel academically. Our teachers integrate biblical principles throughout the day, ensuring your child grows into a compassionate and morally grounded individual. Our students are also able to participate in extracurricular activities with the Bemidji School District. For more information about St. Mark's Day School, call John at 218-444-3939 or at principal at stmarksbemidji.org.